and we are now live. So awesome. So welcome everyone. My name is Lucia and I am hosting today's Hangout and we are celebrating biodiversity. So yesterday was the International Day for Biological Diversity and in honor of that we are hosting 20 30 minute, 30 minute hangouts today. So we're hanging out with scientists, explorers and conservationists and that's what exploring by the seat of your pants is all about bringing adventure, science, and conservation into the classrooms around the world. Today, we are around North America, so we have various classes around from Canada and from the USA. I'll do a little quick little intro. We have a class, Ms. Maisel's grade two class from Milton, Ontario. We have Ms. Logan's grade sevens class from Freehold, New Jersey. Uh, we have Mr. Pennington's grade eights from Denton, Maryland. Uh, Mr. Miss Segretto's grade fours from Oakville, Ontario, which is actually where I am broadcasting from also. Uh, Mr. Tornberg, grade fives from Fontana, California. And Miss Tucker's grade sixes from Mount Vernon, Indiana. So we have a full house in here and it's going to be great. And we are hanging out with the BD Biodiversity Museum, which is located in right now sunny Vancouver, British Columbia. And with over two million million specimens in their collections, one of them, one of them is the largest, is the 26 meter long blue whale that you can probably see behind you there. Uh, it is the largest blue whale skeleton in Canada. Now, this skeleton has quite the story, which is what we are going to learn about today. So I'm going to take it away, Sheila and Vincent. I'm Sheila, and I'm a, a museum interpreter here at the BD Biodiversity Museum. My name is Vincent. I'm also a museum interpreter here at the BD Biodiversity Museum. All right, so as Lucia was saying, um, what we have behind us is the biggest of our two million plus specimens. Um, she is the skeleton from a blue whale. So, um, before I get to our blue whale, just talk a little bit about what it means to be a specimen at the BD Biodiversity Museum. So, we've got biodiversity means life and all of the variety of it. So we've got plants, we've got animals, we have fungi, we have all kinds of animals, and of course many of them are vertebrates like our blue whale here. And so what makes this specimen so special? Well, as Lucia was saying, she is a blue whale. She's the largest blue whale specimen we have, and blue whales as a species are the largest mammal in the world. In fact, they're the largest animal in the world, and they're the largest animal ever. She, as um, we were saying, is 26 meters. Um, blue whales can, are on average 24 to 27 meters. The largest blue whale ever found was 33? 33, almost 33 meters in length. Almost 33 meters in length. So that's, I basically say it's two school buses long. It's, she's big. Um, and more than just big, she's massive. Um, blue whales, when they are full grown, can weigh anywhere from 100 to 200 tons. So it's pretty heavy. And let me just add to that, because I'll get into a little bit more of this later. What you're seeing there is just the skeleton. Don't forget that there's a huge amount of blubber surrounding that skeleton. So it is indeed a very, very large mammal. Yes, so the skeleton's gigantic, but even that isn't the whole picture, because all of her fat, muscle, her, her tail, her fluke would make her even longer, even bigger. So. This massive animal, of course, needs a massive home. So you will find blue whales in oceans around the world, except for the Arctic Ocean. Um, blue, big blue here, we're very creative. We named our big blue whale, Big Blue. Um, <laughs> big blue was um, found um, on the Atlantic. So in Prince Edward Island on the east coast of Canada, she washed up on the beach there. And that's where we found her. So sadly, we think what happened was she hit her head on a large ship um, and she washed up on the beach where they, um, where they found her. So an animal as big as a blue whale obviously needs to keep themselves fed. Um, I know I eat a lot and I'm nowhere near the size of a blue whale. She eats a lot of food. So those of you in the classrooms might know what blue whales eat. So I've got a big picture of the kind of food that they eat. So that there is a really blown up picture of their food. So. This animal that they eat is called krill. It's also got a jar here full of krill. So you can see they're not so big. They're at, at the biggest about two centimeters, so less than an inch. So these, um, these little critters, um, that's all they eat. So an animal the size of two school buses subsists entirely on these 
smaller than an inch, shrimp-like animals called krill. So of course, they don't just chew on them with teeth or grab them with a fork or something. So you might know that the big whales, like the blue whale, the humpback whales and such, are called baleen whales, so named for these things in their mouth. So instead of teeth, so some animals that you might be familiar with, like the killer whale, dolphins, they have teeth and they hunt fish, seals, things like that. Blue whales have baleen, so they're plates made of keratin. So that's the same thing fingernails and hair are made of. And they're basically like plates of whiskers hanging from the top of their mouth. And so she'll take a lunge and catch a whole bunch of krill inside her mouth, and then she'll spit out the water. And when the water comes out of her mouth, the krill gets stuck in the hairs. She can eat four to six tons of krill in one day. So that's basically eating a grown elephant every day. Now, of course, I've just talked about what a blue whale eats, but what eats a blue whale? Indeed, if a blue whale or any other whale was to die naturally, their body would gradually sink to the bottom of the ocean. And in areas that are very, very deep, uh, 1,000, 2,000 meters, there's generally not very much food except what we might call uh, marine snow, uh, exoskeletons or plankton, dead plankton, various small organisms like that or uh, broken up algae even that eventually fall to the bottom of the sea, but that's not a lot of food for organisms at the bottom of the ocean to depend on. So when a whale f dies naturally and falls to the bottom of the, the ocean, it becomes a huge island of food for all of the sorts of organisms that are living at those depths, including things like uh, nursing sharks or other types of sharks, ratfish, um, uh, various other types of hagfish, for example. And once all of that amount of flesh and blubber is removed, then essentially you have the carcass. This is when we get into a very interesting recycling process where tiny little worms, and you'll not be able to see this very well, but this is a vial, and at the bottom of that vial is something called a bone-eating worm. And tiny little larval forms of the, these bone-eating worms are in the currents at the bottom of the ocean, and they're looking for a carcass, like a whale fall. Once they find that, they land on the, what's left of the whale, basically the skeleton, and they will start to digest the bones. So bone-eating worm, uh, another name for that is a zombie worm. These are extremely unusual, these types of worms. In fact, they were only found in 2002. So the bone-eating worm that we think would have eaten Big Blue had Big Blue died naturally in the Atlantic Ocean is a worm called the bone-eating snot flower worm. Uh, in less, this, this can take a long time for the worms to eat uh, the skeleton, obviously, because the worms are very tiny, but they completely carpet the carcass and are consuming all of the collagens and the fats inside the bones with the help of bacteria, I might add. Um, and this can take many years, or as in the case of California in Monterey Canyon, uh, a 10 meter, actually 9 meter gray whale was completely digested in seven years. So talk about an interesting recycling process. Here's your 9 meter long gray whale up here. You can see the carcass. Uh, and not very well the red color of the worms, but the worms are there, and in seven years, you can barely see a carcass at all. The skeleton has been completely consumed by these tiny bone-eating worms. Uh, the bone-eating worms are um, what we would call extremophiles. There are, it's a special family of marine worms called Siboglinidae, and they can um, survive at these depths and in these highly um, potentially toxic areas for humans, for example, in spite of the depth of the ocean. Um, and they are using 
being assisted by bacteria who can help to digest that bone and provide food not only for themselves, the bacteria, but also these bone-eating worms. So how are we doing time-wise here? With four minutes left? Okay. You got, you got time. Good. Okay. And I'll just quickly say that um, if anyone's heard of hydrothermal vent worms, which were discovered in about 1977, uh, this whole family of marine worms is very unique in, in the areas of the ocean that they can survive. What's very interesting about the bone-eating worm is that what actually lands on the skeleton or the carcass of the whale uh, are females. And the female can look like this. So you've got a crown or a plume of tentacles that the worm gets its oxygen through. We have a trunk that extends quite a distance um, that has glands inside, it has a heart, it has a circulatory system, it has muscles. But down here is this weird root-like structure, which is totally unheard of in an animal. Um, and in there is where the female has an ovisac and produces lots of eggs. Um, the green that you see around the root here is actually um, bacteria, and that bacteria is uh, uh, secreting enzymes which help to digest and eat the bone and the collagen inside the bone. And um, where are the males, you might say? Uh, the males are in this area of the trunk. They're very, very tiny and they never grow beyond the larval stage. So what, this is what we call sexual dimorphism. The female is very large, actually very large being only about a maximum of seven centimeters, but the whales are very, very tiny. Sorry, the whales. The, the males are very, very tiny. So this in itself is an extremely unusual type of worm, but it does a huge... Um, uh, amount of good for many organisms at the bottom of the ocean by digesting these natural whale falls and providing food for other organisms that are in that vicinity and nor normally in a, in a very poor food supply area. So anything else that you might want to throw in there? Well, I mean, it is worth noting that the blue whale doesn't have any natural predators while they're alive, so um, organisms like the hagfish and the nursing sharks will eat the, the sort of the dying flesh, and the animals like the bone-eating worms will recycle the skeleton back into the food chain. It is worth noting there is one animal that figured out how to hunt blue whales while they're alive. Good. Of course, us humans. Yes. Um, a couple about 100 or so years ago, um, people stopped hunting blue whales, but before that, people hunted many of them, and their numbers depleted quite a lot. Um, of course, um, blue whales have not adapted to deal with ships, so even without being hunted, um, blue, Big Blue, for example, um, was struck by a ship, we think. So, um, of course, they might be the largest animal, but we've come up with slightly different ways to get in their way. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. So of the approximately 300,000 blue whales that used to exist in the world's oceans, we now have approximately five to 6,000 remaining. And in spite of the fact that whaling uh, was ceased, uh, supposedly in the about 1968, I think, um, that population worldwide has not been able to recover. And so what Vincent is saying about more ships on the ocean, unfortunately, uh, potentially means uh, even more pressure and stress on these blue whales to try and increase that, that population and keep that species surviving for the long term. Okay. Awesome. How do you know? get that whale from PEI all the way across the country to BC. <laughs> well, so, um, as you mentioned, uh, she, um, her body washed up on the beach in Prince Edward Island. This was actually in the 80s, and uh, Prince Edward Island is a very small place. It washed up in the town of Tiganish, which is a small town in a small province, so um, they didn't really know what to do with this giant carcass, so they dug a giant hole and kind of stuck her in the hole because they 
didn't want her sticking up the whole stinking up the whole town. Um, a couple decades later, um, we were opening the Beatty Museum, um, and they wanted to have a nice, big, sort of charismatic halo specimen, if you will. And um, the team here um, found out about the blue whale that was buried in Prince Edward Island, and they went over there. They dug her up. Prince Edward Island, if you do not know this, has a very clay-like soil, which means there aren't that many microbes in the soil. So not bone-eating worms, but basically the land version of them who recycle um, dead material back to the environment. Um, there aren't a lot of them in Prince Edward Island soil, so her carcass was not actually that decomposed. It was, instead of being a skeleton, they found a rotting corpse full of rotting meat and blubber. So it was very stinky. Um, we have an example of the stinky uh, schmag. That's the name for the stinky, rotten whale stuff. Unfortunately, we don't have smell vision so you won't be able to, <laughs> or maybe fortunately, you won't be able to smell that. But imagine that the team um, spent their time in the guck, cutting up and getting rid of all the rotting meat and cleaning up the skeleton. And in fact, not just blubber, but whales also have a lot of oil in their bones to keep them warm and to keep them buoyant in the water. So her oil-filled bones were another challenge to clean up. So these stinky, stinky bones were put on trucks, put on trains, brought all the way across Canada. Trucks, yeah. Um, was it? Yeah, oh, no, yeah. it was trucks donated by CN Ralph. Yes. Transfer uh, trucks, yes. Um, apparently, the truck that was full of the bones, they would park at a truck stop, and every other truck would leave as soon as it got there because <laughs> it was so stinky. Um, it took them over a year to clean the bones, make them not smelly anymore. Thank goodness, because we work underneath her, so I'm glad she doesn't stink anymore. But, yeah, so it's quite the journey to go from um, whale to skeleton specimen here at the Beatty Museum. Yeah, so it sounds really exciting to me. <laughs> and in fact, uh, the, the transfer truck took the whale, the whale bones uh, to Victoria, where we have our um, master articulator, who was the person involved in actually cleaning up all of the bones so that they could become odor-free. <laughs> and then they actually uh, went through the process of hanging the whale in the atrium here. Amazing. Awesome. So now we'll go around and we'll get some uh, round of questions from all the classes. We'll do one question per class uh, and then we have time. We'll do another second round. So we'll start with, let's see, uh, Miss, where am I? Sorry, I'm very lost on my sheet here. Miss Logan's class. So I'll unmute, or you can unmute your mic. I have to find this class. There it is. Okay. Sorry. Are you guys able to unmute your mic there, Miss Logan's class? Oh, there you got it. Awesome. All right, what's your question? When was the whale put in the museum? Do you guys get that? When was the whale put in the museum? The museum opened with the whale hanging in 2010. So the the whale was actually buried at in Prince Edward Island in 1987, and then dug up after that, brought to Victoria, cleaned, and then actually hung in the museum in 2010. Wow, so it was, dug, it was buried for a really long time. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. It's very cold in Prince Edward Island, so <laughs> those tiny little microorganisms that we were hoping, everyone was hoping would uh, help to decompose that carcass. Mm -hmm. As Vincent said, just didn't quite have the opportunity to do that. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to Mr. Pennington's grade 8 class. Uh, so if you guys want to ask your question. Uh, how heavy are the whale bones? Oh, my name's Avery from Denton, Maryland. <laughs> so how heavy are the whale bones? Avery, that's a good question. Don't ask me how heavy the bones are. Um, I want to say about 4,000 pounds. No, is that right? You know what? I don't know the answer to that. Hmm? <laughs> I actually have, I, give me a second and I will find that because I <laughs> looked at it. Sorry, lots of numbers in our head here. Uh, question. I only know how heavy she was complete, but not as a skeleton. 
Um, and again, if it's um, skeleton with oil in it, as opposed to dried out skeleton, two different weights again. Okay. Ah, the skeleton itself, here we go, 3,500 kilograms. So just the skeleton. Oh, wow. <laughs> Quite, quite heavy. <laughs> so if you want to compare that with the, the actual weight of the whale, it's going to be somewhere around 150 to 170 tons. So <laughs> most of the weight is still not skeleton. Yes. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of blubber on the whales. <laughs> well, when you think that they're swimming in water, that's maybe 8 to 10 degrees centigrade. Uh, they are warm-blooded, like us, mm -hmm. so they need lots of blubber to help keep them warm. Yes, good question. All right, so we have Ms. Segreto's class next. They have to leave in a few minutes, so we'll take that question now. Hey, Elaine. Um, I have a question. Um, what, in what year do you think the blue whale's population will increase back to normal? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, we can say that humpback whales, are you familiar with humpback whales? They're another type of baby whale, and Big Blue is a baby whale. So this is 20, 2016, I believe, humpback whales were taken off um, a list that we call of special concern because their populations were also very low after the whale hunting. So by since 1968, when the whaling was supposed to have ceased, uh, humpback whales showed signs of increasing their population by about 2016, I believe. So that was a good sign. Uh, however, the blue whales have not, and they're they are bigger than the humpback whales. And um, the increased traffic of ships on the ocean probably are not helping the blue whales in terms of their recovery. So that's a really good question. Blue whales are still considered red listed. That means they're still endangered. And it's really hard to predict when they might recover. We can only hope that they will recover, as did the humpback whales. That's a good question. There you go. Thanks, guys. So it's okay if you guys have to jump off Negretto's class. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Mr. Thornburg's class. See if you guys have a question. See if we can unmute you. Um, can you guys unmute yourselves, maybe? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Ask your question. Okay. Um, like you know how like regular fishes tails are like straight. Does it does it for the humpback whales or blue whales? Does it help them like swim better in the ocean because their tails are like this? Ah, oh, so, so that's a you're talking one. about how a fish, if this is a fish, its tail moves this way, while in a whale it moves this way. Yeah. So yeah. if you think about it, um, I can't say which one is is better for swimming, but if you think about what blue whales. What is what are they descended from, right? So blue whales, they're mammals, correct? Yes. Yeah. So we're mammals, if you think about it, the closest living relative of a whale that's not a whale would be the hippopotamus. So if you think about an animal like a hippopotamus, they have four legs and they kind of like their bone their skeleton are like this, right? Same as a dog or a horse. Like this kind of thing, right? So think about it, a whale is the descendant of that. So if you went to the whale's great 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 grandmother. It was an animal with four legs who only walk like this. So if you think about it, their skeletons are made to go like this, so they swim like that. While a fish has their descendants from organisms whose skeletons move this way. So as for what led to the change, I guess the way you could think of it is since the blue whale is descended from something that had adapted to walking like this, she swims like that. And I'll just add one more thing to that. Um, Many of the whales actually dive down to find their food. They, they can eat at the surface, but sometimes they will dive much deeper, like the blue whale, which actually 
gets its krill at about 30 meters deep. So that's about 100 feet deep in the ocean. So if the tail is this way, it gets much more propulsion to dive down. This kind of tail would not, not enable the whale to dive very deep. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> great. Good. Awesome. Great question. Yeah. All right. And then we'll ask or Miss Tucker's class, you guys have a question? I don't know which account you want to ask your question on, so you can unmute whichever one is easiest for you. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay. Hey, Riley, question. Um, how much does a newborn baby whale weigh? You get that? How much does a newborn baby whale weigh? I believe it was about a ton. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yes. So a newborn blue whale would weigh around a ton. So they grow a lot. So remember we were saying um, grown blue whales are 100 to 200 tons. So and, and a newborn is about six to seven meters long. So they're pretty big in terms of size. So uh, easily a, a one ton, I think, would be yes. the answer to that. How yeah. do those newborn babies eat? Well, as um, we were saying earlier, blue whales are mammals, and the key trait of being a mammal is the mother feeds milk to the young. So the mother has mammary glands where she feeds milk to the calf. And once the calf gets to a certain age or size, then the calf will switch from feeding on milk to actually feeding on krill. And of course, the uh, parents, the mother in particular, will be assisting the calf in teaching them how to dive and find those krill. In fact, that's a really interesting thing about the blue whales is that they have funny little whiskers on their chin that help them to detect when there's big populations of krill at about 30 meters deep. And those little whiskers are what helps them to uh, decide the time is right to open their mouth and get that big mouthful of water and krill inside. So lots of very cool adaptations that the blue whales have for living in the ocean. Awesome. And then we have one final question from um, Paris, Ontario. So they are watching live on our YouTube page. Uh, now behind is the blue whale, and they are asking what those scratches marks are that look like along the side there, like three yeah. grooves there. <laughs> yeah. So those, those tunnel-shaped lines are where nerves and blood vessels would supply the baleen. So those bristly uh, structures that are helping to get the krill out of their out of the water, the baleen are, are hanging down, and those lines or tubes, basically tubular structures, carry the blood vessels and the nerves that are supplying the baleen. So don't forget, baleen is like our hair, and it's continually growing, so it does need supplies of blood and nerve. Uh, so that's what those lines are for. That's a good observation. That's a fair distance away to see. Yeah, that's a great question. And then finally, are blue whales larger than dinosaurs? Uh, <laughs> so he is the most massive animal ever. So it is worth noting that some dinosaur skeletons have been found that if you were to take the head and the tail of the skeleton and you kind of stretch it to the maximum that you think it could have gone, it might be closer to 40 meters, which you'll notice longer than 33 meters. So again, of course, the dinosaur would not have been in that shape. It would have been more like that, right? Because I don't think they were stretched out during their life. But, and also that's an estimate based on the skeleton. We don't have the whole dinosaur, right? But we do know that if you were to estimate the weight the mass of those dinosaurs, they'd be nowhere. Huge. But, but still, um, I think, I forget, there's the Argentinosaurus, the skeleton found, a, a fossil skeleton of a dinosaur found in Argentina, as the name implies. Um, that's the one they estimate might have been 40 meters long. I believe the mass, it was less than 100 pounds. Yeah. It was definitely less than the blue mass. And actually, if you think about it, most of the dinosaurs lived on land. And if they could only carry so much mass before uh, gravity would just prevent those large dinosaurs from being able to move around very far. So really, uh, gravity was a limitation, or weight was a limitation because of gravity. So um, 
dinosaurs may have challenged the length of the blue whale, but not the mass, not the huge mass on the sky. Awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of our hangout. So thank you guys so much for teaching us all about blue whales today for Biodiversity Day. Uh, we really, I think everyone really enjoyed it. We had some really great questions from all our classes. Uh, I'll unmute everyone's mics and you guys can all yell a nice goodbye, wave. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye guys, thanks so much for joining us today. This broadcast will also be online, so if you want to watch it again, feel free to go on to the Exploring by the Cedar Point page. And once again, thanks a lot, a lot from us to the Beating Museum. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.